It's a great pleasure to introduce um, Emma Bianchi, who I am sure needs no introduction, but I'll introduce her anyway. She is Assistant Professor of Comp Lit at New York University. Her research interests lie in ancient philosophy, literature, 20th century and contemporary continental philosophy, and feminist and queer theory. And all of these interests are woven together in her new book, um, The Feminine Symptom, Aleatory Matter in the Aristotelian Cosmos, which has just recently appeared uh, with Fordham in 2014. And if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, it's a really fabulous book. I stayed up far too late last night reading the final section of it. Um, it's wonderful. So I think her talk today is going to be building on the work from the book. And the title of that talk is Aristotle's Zoology. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, this, uh, the, 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 what I'm saying today actually sort of comes from the book itself, so with a bit of a sort of structuring and uh, uh, framing. So, um, so it's sort of a taste. Um, okay, the Zoon Ekon Logon, the Zoon Politikon. These famous phrases of Aristotle define the human as the animal possessing logos and the animal that deliberates politically. In the context of a thinking of the post-human, such designations may call for certain displacements, speculations about the extent to which other animals use language and indeed whether and how other animals engage in political activity. In fact, a piece in the New York Times, The Stone, appeared just last week entitled, Man is Not the Only Political Animal. And here, Justin E. Smith argued in just this vein for a new understanding of animal politics, bringing to bear evidence of, um, quote, complex social organization across the animal kingdom, including collective del deliberation, division of labor, ritual conflict resolution, and, and so on. But my, my concern today is rather different. My premise is that the animal organism is the key paradigm, indeed the metaphysical touchstone for Aristotle. Coming to be is arguably Aristotle's central metaphysical concern, and while technical examples and metaphors of carpentry, sculpting, and doctoring abound in the physics and the metaphysics and throughout the biological writings, it is coming to be in nature that Aristotle finds truly wondrous, truly mysterious, and truly in need of explanation. Indeed, Aristotle's investigations into the parts, structures, behavior, life cycles, and generation of animals constitute a full quarter of his extant corpus. In the breadth of his natural philosophy, and indeed stretching into humanistic investigations of ethics, politics, rhetoric, and poetics, a biological or specifically a zoological sensibility can be discerned insofar as Aristotle's thought is at these many levels insistently teleological, that is, always concerned with how beings unfold toward their ends as inherent goods, it is zoological. Now I realize these are large claims and I can't possibly do them justice today, but what I will do is first outline how biological coming to be, and specifically the coming to be of the animal organism, um, you know, it's his student Theophrastus that deals with the plants, um, uh, is intertwined with Aristotle's metaphysics and specifically how Aristotle's theory of sexual reproduction forms a cornerstone of his metaphysical thinking. Um, and in so doing, I will discuss how the hegemonic unity of the animal organism begins to become undone in the face of what I call the feminine symptom. So these arguments are really at the core of, of the book. Um, at the scene of sexual reproduction, the male principle acts upon the passive matter of the female to reproduce, uh, to re to be produce an offspring, but if the offspring is to be female, it must be subject to an unaccountable disruption, one that happens approximately 50% of the time, resulting in famously the mild form of monstrosity that is the female. Um, Aristotle here must grapple with subterranean and unpredictable material forces, an aleatory dimension of matter that cannot be accounted for in his famous schema of the four causes. But these forces, forces nonetheless act in service of the teleology, and this is uh, uh, what makes it sy symptomatic in my reading. And here I'd like to hear in the word symptom, its Greek root symptoma, which means coincidence. Uh, something that happens by chance, literally a falling together, some peepto. 
Um, this aleatory dimension of the natural world is what falls outside the teleological natural order. It is one that he constantly polemicizes against in his re repeated objections to uh, the aleatory natural philosophies of Democritean atomism and elemental Empedocleanism. Rather than being governed by anything like natural law, as we think of it in, in modernity, uh, it appears for Aristotle as an order of violent and disagreeable force, uh, unknowable, that often acts against nature, para fusin. In the context of nature, Aristotelian metaphysics thus produces an agonic scene where teleological and anti-teleological forces face off with one another. An animal biology is the theater for the most suggestive of these battles. In what follows, I'll show how a scene of technical production emerges as a sort of prophylaxis in the face of the monstrous threats of aleatory matter. A consideration of the Greek notion of automaton will be central here. Ta automaton denotes for the Greeks, as it does for us, a wondrous, apparently self-moving homuncular puppet but paradoxically, automaton also denotes the random and spontaneous motions of the natural world. And both these conceptions, technical wonder and natural exteriority, play a key role in Aristotle's account of animal genesis. At the close of the paper, I will draw some lines of connection between my characterization of Aristotle's zoology and metaphysics and some current uh, currents in um, uh, contemporary biology and chaos theory. Um, so in Physics 2.3, Aristotle lays out his theory of the four causes, ITI, the essential factors responsible for things coming to be. Um, and at the risk of taking us back to freshman philosophy, let me recap. Uh, we have the formal cause, final cause, material cause, and motive cause, the archaekinesios. Um, formal cause, I mean, all of them have their complexities, but it, uh, formal cause is quite familiar, uh, form, shape, logos. Uh, final cause is the end to which a thing aims or what it is for, that's clear enough. Um, the material cause is the stuff out of which a thing is made. What persists or underlies through any becoming or change is the hupokaimenon, so the clay that is acted upon and transformed from a lump into a pot. Uh, the motive cause is, on the other hand, what we might designate as the agent that can be identified as responsible for the change. And contemporary renderings often emphasize the proximity of this cause to modern sounding billiard ball uh, uh, conceptions of causation. But a quick look at Aristotle's text deflects this thought. Rather, the motive cause is a father or an advisor, he says. Um, a craftsman, or more, more specifically, the craftsman's art, or uh, 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 the craftsman, qua, qua, the art, qua, the craftsman qua his art, um, and uh, there are uh, there are problems between you know a sort of ambiguity between the craftsman himself and his art and their relationship that I can't really get into here, but that's that's the motive cause. Um, schematically speaking, then the motive cause acts and the material cause is acted upon. Uh, we should note, however, that it is technical to be that the four causes may be most easily distinguished. The matter of the pot is clay, its form is the shape or, or the logos in the potter's art as introduced by the potter. Its motive cause is the potter as the agent of his art. And its final cause is drinking or perhaps something ultimate like living well, pleasure and health. Um, in animal becoming, by contrast, the causes resolve into two, the matter or stuff out of which an animal is made, opposed to the final three, the, the last three causes, which are, at the same t which, are the, at, which are the same at the level of name or genus. The formal, final, and motive causes of a foal are all the adult horse, although the motive cause is the male parent, identical generically, if not numerically, to the formal and final causes. So this bifurcation of the causes in the reproductive scene therefore accomplishes a radical metaphysical separation of male and female. The sperm acts upon the menstrual blood as the carpenter acts upon the wood. Quote, it is the shape, uh, morphe, and the form, idos, which pass from the carpenter, and this is from Generation of Animals, uh, which pass from the carpenter, and they come into being by means of the movement in the material, hule, 
uh, his hands move his tools and his tools move the material. In a similar way to this, nature acting in the mail of semen emitting animals uses the semen as tool. Aristotle, in this way, installs a technicity, uh, a scene of artifactual production at the heart of animal generation. The problem then is evident. Uh, if the four essential causes indeed provide a full account of generation and the motive cause is located in the father, what is the second source of physical motion that acts to obstruct or intercede in the case of a female offspring? What is the provenance of this randomness um, that disrupts the teleology? And here we have to look at what else Aristotle says about matter. Um, so he has a few different formulations of matter, um, notably uh, uh, in Physics 1.9 we find matter itself as desiring and stretching out toward a form, or regasthai. Um, um, matter uh, desires form as the ugly desires the beautiful, as the female desires the male. Um, here it appears as a strange kind of subject of desire and having a sort of motive quality in itself. Um, and one might connect this to the inclination, rope, that impels the elements toward their proper places in the latter books of De Kylo. Here matter is already folded in advance into the potentiality actuality schema, into the teleology. Its incipient vectoral orientation toward form appears in its very being um, at its heart, and here we see it acting uh, appropriately and obediently. Um, but in one remarkable passage on spontaneous generation, Genesis Automatos, uh, at Metaphysics uh, Zeta 9, Aristotle actually describes matter in a, in a different mode altogether, as in some cases having the power to initiate its own motion, uh, and sometimes in a particular way and sometimes not, he says. Um, and these examples of sometimes not in a particular way, he gives the main, the main uh, illustration he gives is dancing, orchestestai, in the middle voice. So, uh, matter is thus a thoroughly labile and ambivalent concept for Aristotle. It is once passive and malleable, eager and obedient, and may also obscurely move in unpredictable ways. Um, it is both natural and anti-nature, teleological and anti-teleology. And it's precisely in biological context that, these, that this errant lability is taken to task by a nature that appears increasingly agentic and authoritative. In many examples throughout the biological writings, nature makes an appearance in the guise of the craftsman or director, opportunistically taking up or discarding the, the vicissitudes of matter insofar as they befit its purposes. Um, in, the pas in a passage about the formation of flesh and bone in GA 2.6, uh, Aristotle describes how they are hardened by the heat in fetal development, just as earthenware is baked. He tells us, however, that, he that heat, quote, does not produce poie, flesh or bone, out of any chance thing, at any chance place, or a chance time. But this happens by nature, at a place and time ordained by nature. To pefukos kai hu pefuke, kai hote pefuken. He continues, quote, no more could a carpenter produce a chest out of anything but wood, and equally without the carpenter, no chest will be produced out of the wood, end quote. Then a few lines later, nature is compared with a cook capable, capable of providing the appropriate amount of heat. And then just a little later, a painter appears, a zoographu, one who paints from life. Uh, quote, in the early stages, the parts are all traced out in outline. Later on, they get their various colors and softnesses and hardnesses, just as if a life painter were at work on them. Hosper an hupozoographu tes fuseos demi urgumena. On the one hand, then, there are raw physical processes at work. The hot and the cold have their various necessary effects on various materials, setting, melting, hardening to various degrees, pushing fluids and air this way and that, and so on. 
Aristotle gives no explicit causal or philosophical account of these movements and does not separate law-governed movements from random ones, as I said before. Rather, there are these two agonic orders of necessity. There's a, a non-teleological uh, compulsion, BR, he calls it, uh, force, on the one hand, and things that are necessitated by teleological ends on the other. But as a doctor's son, Aristotle is certainly familiar with the medical tradition, the importance of the hot and the cold in those works now collected under the name of Hippocrates, as well as the provenance of hot, cold, moist, and dry in the pre-Socratic Fusikoi and in, in Empedocles. Um, indeed, you know, he's, he's the source that, uh, for, for um, many of the fragments about, uh, 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 concerning those authors. And the more these unexplained material operations are explicitly considered, the more a particular conception of nature comes into view. And here we have nature with a capital N, nature as craftsman, craftsman or demiurge, cook, clay modeler, painter, employing and making various products in the active voice. At the close of Generation of Animals, we find the doctor, who becomes a sort of figure for nature itself, imposing his cuts. And here these are less the cuts of a knife than the cuts of decision, of choice, of prohiresis, sculpting pliant materials into dynamic shape, accepting some and rejecting others, forming them into a fully functional energeia with particularly convenient tools at his disposal and with a goal identical to that of nature, nam namely health and preservation of life. Um, so Aristotle is usually understood to theorize no demiurgic creator in his cosmos. The divine prime mover of the metaphysics is famously impassive and disinterested, certainly not a creator divinity. But perhaps here in the biological texts, we find buried and obscure the demiurge himself, or rather a proliferation of demi urgoi, a thousand tiny artisans dispersed throughout nature and operating in its name. Pursuing this logic of technicity within nature yet further, it's at the scene of that most enigmatic of biological mysteries, that of the passage from seed to complex organism, that we find the paradoxical operation of the figure of automaton. A generation of animals 2.5, Aristotle describes how the male implants the active principle of movement, the arche kinesios, into the matter provided by the female. After this, one event of fetal development follows from the other, just as, he says, in the wondrous automatons, hosper and tois automatois thaumasi. The Greek wondrous automatons were technically complex mechanisms made up of ropes and pulleys activated by a small initial motion. And this is, that's the force of the analogy. There's a small initial motion that comes from the sperm, um, leading to a miraculous series of movements apparently spontaneous and self-directed. They are described in detail several hundred years later by Galen and Heron of Alexandria, but it is indeed these very thaumata that are also responsible for creating the famous shadows in Plato's cave. While Plato's wonders lull, captivate, and seduce the prisoners in the cave, the importance of wonder to Aristotle's method cannot be underestimated. The first book of the metaphysics, as we know, gives the experience of wonder as an incitement to thinking, as the original and continuing arche of philosophy itself. And indeed, in the second chapter of book one, uh, the automatic puppets themselves appear, along with solstices and the incommensurability of the diagonal as exemplifying the wondrous as such. As we have seen, however, the word automaton also denotes the unwelcome, spontaneous burgeonings of nature. How the aleatory motions of the natural world come to bear the same name as complex technical wonders that mimic intentional movement is itself an intriguing question. And the following considerations may help sh shed light on an old et etymological puzzle regarding automaton, as well as Aristotle's specific usage. 
Um, so in the physics, Aristotle gives his own etymological uh, uh, speculation that automaton is derived from um, auto plus martain, which means in vain or to no purpose. Um, and this bolsters his point that what occurs by chance does so in a way that it's at odds with any given telos or that exceeds or disrupts the pursuit of a goal. However, most, though not all, philological authorities trace the root of maton in automaton to the Indo-European main, meaning to think, with the implication that the automaton is self-moving because it appears to be possessed of a mind, also derived from men, and to think for itself. This may make a certain sense uh, when we think of it in relation to the homuncular puppets, um, however, the imputing of something like an already separate and separable mind to an inanimate object should strike us as rather a modern, um, um, not so much a Greek operation. And the archaic Greeks may have seen all sorts of natural forces and entities as divine or as inhabited or commanded by divinities, but the notion of a mind or soul as separate from body or matter only emerges slowly and unevenly in the Greek philosophical tradition, as is evidenced by, for example, the thought of uh, Anaxagoras and Plato. Um, furthermore, it's hard to see how such an etymology could account for the meaning of automaton as, automaton as spontane spontaneity in nature. Um, automaton first appears in, the write in, write in writing in Hesiod and Homer. Uh, Hesiod uses it in works and days in the story of Pandora's box. In order to avenge the original gesture of human technicity, Prometheus's get theft of fire, Zeus fashions Pandora, the first woman on earth. Um, and when she opens her box of gifts from the gods, terrible things ensue, including diseases that, of their own accord, automati, uh, spread among men. Um, resonances abound here with the Aristotelian count in which the random motions of automaton are pressed into the service of teleological reproduction throughout, th through the phenomenon of the female. And the female appears as the crossing zone where the aleatory and the purposeful find their inexplicable conjuncture. In Hesiod, the diseases that multiply are not possessed of any mind or will, but a part of the mute proliferations of nature. And Pandora herself is also, in a sense, a puppet of the gods, a kind of automaton in her own right. A second instance of the term occurs shortly thereafter in which the Earth's fruitfulness, enjoyed by the golden race of mortal men living in the time of Kronos, is described as automate, the burgeonings of the natural world of Gaia, the fecund feminine Earth, are once again at issue. The three instances of the term appear in Homer's Iliad. First, when Agamemnon calls a council of elders, Menelaus comes unbidden, automatos, because he knows in his heart, katathumon, the concerns of his brother. Second, when Hera and Athena, in full warrior glory, furious with the all-powerful father's use, for his support of the Trojans, set out from Olympus in their chariot. Hera lashes the horses, and the gates of heaven open, self-bidden, automatoi. And lastly, when Thetis visits Hephaestus, in order to plead for her shield and armor for Achilles, she finds him at work, fashioning golden-wheeled tripods, which might, of themselves, automatoi, enter the gathering of the gods, and then return to his house. So while Hesiod's examples refer to the spontaneous motions of nature, Homer's refer instead to mysterious actions at a distance occurring in and among the world of mortals, gods, and artifacts. The first two are apparently incited by the strength of emotion and involve transfer of affect of, of a man upon another man with whom he shares a bond of kinship. The other, of goddesses raging against Zeus's paternal authority. Are thought and will at work here? Certainly intention is implied, but it is manifested through the force of powerful emotions, its mode of motion utterly obscure, unconscious, and uncanny. 
Menelaus travels without knowing why, moved, up by, moved by something in his heart rather than his mind. The gates are caught up in the motions of Hera's fury against Zeus. The last example, the self-moving tripods of Hephaestus, inaugurates the marvelous automaton as the product of the craftsman who, through his skill and cunning, creates a wonder to behold. Thauma idesthai. Homer is also the source for a suggestive essay by 19th century French linguist Michel Bréal, who argued that the core sense of automaton does not involve thought, but rather movement. Um, he believes that the root is from the participle memaos, from my oh my, to desire, to be eager. And he seeks to show that within the Homeric corpus, memaios tends to refer to any kind of rapid motion, a physical force rather than a desire or a will of the soul. Producing, uh, proposing that an element of the Indo-European root main signifies to move, to run. But this Indo-European root harbors a variety of coexistent meanings as various as meno, mem memona, to desire, to seek, to yearn for, to be furiously eager. Menos, might and force. Uh, meneme, memory. Mino, to madden, and mania, madness. Musa, muse, and manthano, to learn. Here an echo of the double meaning of automaton may be heard, the swift burdenings of nature, but also that which moves through consciousness. The related noun is tomenos, might, force, strength, fierceness, life, spirit, passion, and intent or purpose. And you see that, that range that gets kind of codified in this strange way in, in Aristotle. Um, the Sanskrit cognate is manas, spirit or passion. Uh, Minamai indicates to rage furiously, to be mad as in the Bacchic frenzy of Minads. Um, but it's also used of natural things. Automaton thus moves through the world and moves through us in a way that exceeds our conscious intention or control, or the hegemonic unifications of zoological, teleological thinking. So once the secrets of automaton are rerouted, first to the god Hephaestus, and henceforth to the craftsman, the demiurgos, the technical wizard or puppet maker, the appropriations at stake are evident. Automaton is then moving, burgeoning, natural, fully alive, but also that which is now only seemingly alive, the illusion of life given by the maker and secreted within it by means of his craft. Like nature, which as we know from Heraclitus, loves to hide, the master craftsman not only makes, but covers over the tracks that would signify his craft. To risk a vast simplification, automaton, not unlike woman herself, signifies not only the death drive, semblance, the threat of repetition compulsion, errancy, blindness, castration, and thanatos, but also occasions an erotic, Pygmalion-esque conception of the organism as technical product, promising masculine mastery of life over death. And yet, automaton still remains within the Aristotelian account of nature as irreducible, threatening nature's undo undoing, um, and threatening the hegemony of the unified organism through this logic of the feminine symptom. And recent biological thinking also shifts uh, 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 a focus decisively away from the hegemony of the functional totality whose paradigm is the organism or has rethought the organism's becoming in such a way that shatters its hegemonic unity. The mid-20th century work of Gilbert Simondon, for example, incorporates the social collective and sensory environment as well as the pluripotentiality of the developing being and its inherent out-of-phaseness with itself. Um, he he uh, um, formulates a new conception of metastability that fundamentally displaces the substantial finality of the adult individual. I think arguably this is a, a very profound critique of Aristotle's uh, uh, zoology. 
Um, disciplines such as immunology, cellular and molecular biology, ecology and medical ecology emphasize the permeability and precarity of boundaries, as well as web-like constitutive interrelationships between the organism and its surroundings at both macro and microscopic levels, introducing concepts such as the microbiome um, in place of the traditional organism. And I think this uh, resonates with uh, the, the, a quote from uh, Jane Bennett's Vibrant Matter that uh, Miriam brought up in her paper yesterday. So here, health appears less as a feature of a well-oiled and functional machine, clearly bounded, pure, and well-defended against outside attack, than as a question of a diverse and flourishing ecosystem in which humans and a range of external and internal stimuli and microorganisms all play their part in fostering an environment of immune functioning. In evolutionary terms, too, the rise of that most unitary of creatures, the eukaryotic single-celled organism, is now widely understood to be the result not simply of accumulated genetic mutations, but of certain chimerical symbiotic incorporations, such as intracellular organelles like mitochondria or plasmids, um, that are thought to have once been prokaryotic bacteria in their own right, but ingest and ingested but not digested by a host bacterium. So this leads to a very different view of the organism and of health and disease, displacing the view that even a, a disease as life-threatening as cancer should be thought of as an external enemy to be vanquished, but rather as a native process gone awry. The phenomena of life thus appear ir irreducibly plural and relational, and the norms of normal and healthy versus pathological or diseased are, as Georges Canguilhem presci presciently argued, um, no longer easily opposable or extricable. Okay, so I'm just finishing up. Um, the dynamics of teleology, the priority of the end as energeia, as a unified living activity signified par excellence by the activity of the organism with language that is man, uh, the so on ekon logon, governs the entire field uh, of Aristotle's thought, uh, whether biological, physical, metaphysical, cosmological, logical, political, ethical, rhetoric, or poetic. Okay, that's a, that's a big claim. Um, but I, th I think it's right. Um, so that while the model for a teleological cosmos may derive from biology, and especially the biology of man, there's also a distinctly anti-humanist character inherent in this teleological approach. Um, in each area of inquiry, then, Aristotle observes and documents the phenomena with an acute and attuned eye. Uh, he listens to and incorporates the things said by predecessors and finds certain principles continually at work. Things act for the sake of the good and for what is best. And what is essential, whole, unified, healthy, and harmonious is what is best. And by the way, Theophrastus had, you know, trashed this completely. He was like, you know, look at nature, nothing happens for the best. He was sort of a Nietzsche of the ancient world. Um, but, <laughs> but so his... his uh, um, his, his sense of what goes on in the natural world is completely different. Um, but uh, Aristotle, you know, as we know, says always or for the most part, things happen for the best. Um, so central to this harmony is an equilibration of the, of the ubiquitous dynamics of activity and passivity, ruling and being ruled. And this is as true in the political sphere as in the biological and metaphysical. So seen in this way then, a curious confluence emerges between Aristotle's thinking and the insights re yielded by recent developments in chaos theory. So according to the latter, phenomena both natural and human diverse as, uh, I'm gonna do one of these lists that they always do in that discourse, uh, hurricanes, political movements, intracellular processes, economic cycles, fetal development, chemical reactions, internet sensations, geological formations, phase transitions, plant growth, the spread of disease, and so on, are describable by the same nonlinear mathematical equations and broadly topological concepts such as attractors, bifurcations, vortices, and solitons. And you know, there's a sort of technicity of the aleatory at work in, in that mathematics. Um, 
Notable here is that both positions, ancient and contemporary, displace uh, uh, the sovereignty of the human subject characteristic of modernity. Each finds movement and life inherent, inherently at work in both organic and inorganic phenomena. At the same time, the differences are profound. The Aristotelian cosmos is, after all, driven by teleological desire in a scene at once metaphysical, ethical, and ontotheological. Uh, while the world presented by theo chaos theory, its uptake into philosophy and political theory is one of imminent and spontaneous self-assemblage, uh, knowable only dimly through these stochastic and higher mathematical means. Um, and we can think about, you know, the sort of neoplatonism, neo-neoplatonism at work in that sort of mathematical uh, 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 project. Um, this distinction and its political stakes may invest, be investigated more closely by returning once again to a consideration of the long vexed relationship between matter and teleology inaugurated by Aristotle, epitomized in the central figure of the organism. The organism as a functional totality of parts and wholes may not after all be able to shake its teleological legacy quite so easily. Um, and uh, uh, it's the feminine symptom, um, I think, that gives us an opening in which we might be able to see the undoing of teleology that's always at work at its heart. Thanks. So, uh, there's a question about you know, why the scene of, of technicity is a problem for, uh, the presence of the, the scene of technicity in generation is a, is a problem for the human. Um, specifically, I mean, when I when I think about, you know, sort of, con you know, sort of modern problem with with technicity, it's it's that, you know, it it sort of interrupts or kind of obviates the 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 sort of self presence of, of the human to itself, right? But I mean, in the sort of Aristotelian, I mean, in the scene of generation, the, the human's not there yet anyway, right? So so I'm right. I mean, it, and it, it's it's the human's only there with the you know, the sort of appearance of, of, of Logos, right? So I'm just trying to sort of get a grip on, on why, the, why the presence of technicity in generation is, is, a, is a problem, right? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, why is technicity in general a problem, you know? <laughs> um, I, I know, it's, it, I, I, it's, it's, there's a way in which this is obviously a kind of, I, I'm staging a sort of polemic between the natural and the technical that is a far more complicated and intertwined issue than I'm really sort of giving it credit for. So it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a polemic and strategic separation. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I think it's, it's really useful to tease out just how uh, intimate and strange that relationship is in Aristotle himself, given his, um, you know, the fact that he he lived by, you know, looking at uh, uh, creatures in a lagoon for sort of two years. You know, he's so he's so he cares so much about the natural world, and the only means he can find in order to sort of bring it into logos. Uh, is is to sort of introduce these these figures of not not just a uh, you know the um, um, I mean all of these all of these craftsmen these many many craftsmen that are everywhere but also this sort of master craftsman who's this uh, this puppet puppet maker and I and there's there's something <laughs> there's something about that there's a sort of slate. At, of hand at work that is is very tricksy and uh, um, 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 cunning, and I think there's underhanded. I would say um, that I want I want to tease out there. I mean, I think there's a sort of I think it's a problem. I think it's a problem. Um, you know, I think it's just sort of in terms of my own. Eth Ethic, environmental ethics, or natural ethics. It's you know the, the the alterity that nature presents to us is is to me, you know, 
un, unsurpassable. And Aristotle's project is always to surpass it without impu with, imp with impunity. So, yeah. Julia. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, I'm with you completely on, on, uh, on this reading of Aristotle. Um, but my question is, what do you think is Aristotle's last word on this question of the technical model? Um, I think that you are profoundly right in seeing uh, techne as a paradigm in Aristotle's biology. Um, but precisely if we take that seriously, what do you think is the last word of Aristotle on um, automatic generation? In other words, yes, there is, I mean, there are all these different textual moments in which matter is eager uh, in which matter has a tendency, but does that really undo the teleological project? Does this undo the teleological mega picture? Uh, so I'm with you with the symptom, with, with this notion that um, uh, the, the birth of a female is a necessary accident, which is in itself an, an oxymoron, but it's there in the text. So there is all this resistance, yeah. okay? At the same time, again, what's the last word? Because, you know, spontaneous generation is fascinating because it becomes the paradigm of the paradigms. Mm -hmm. But then where, I don't know, but perhaps I would deviate is to give, in, to Aristotle, precisely the, the paradigm of uh, technical production and the cosmic. In other words, what do we make of the fact that spontaneous generation um, happens, happens because of the heat, because of the sky, because of this fundamental analogy between the relationship between, uh, between matter and form on the one hand and earth and the sky and the heat of the sky on the other hand. I know that all this you have thought and written about, but in, in the economy of this presentation, uh, it is as if you left uh, an open end for the, the possible success of matter in its uh, mm. disturbing yeah, yeah. <laughs> guerrilla. Um, yeah. um, thank you so much. Um, you know, I I think that uh, in the last in the last instance, if we can talk about in those terms, um, the figure of the doctor always appears, and this is so fascinating because I mean, yes, we can do a whole you know fairly boring psychological you know. Uh, uh, psychoanalysis of him as the doctor's son, but um, in the spectre of the father. Um, but uh, um, I, I think it's a fascinating example because it's at the scene of, of, of doctoring that, uh, that uh, um, he seems to want to, in, to, to absolutely make the body into hule. Um, you know, the body is no longer alive in that scene because it health become is entirely accrued uh, as the success of the of the medical art in itself, um, and um, the, there's just a you know this passage at the end of the of, of generation of animals is absolutely uh, stunning in that regard, and then there's another passage I'm trying to I think it might be in. Um, Degeneration and corruptione, a corruptione, um, in which he's sort of gra gra grappling with this question of how how does something act upon something else, and um, 
and again, um, you know, the doctor appears. Um, and it's, 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 as if, it's as if the sort of natural ability of the body to r respond or not respond to medical treatment or to, you know, uh, uh, you know, heal itself in certain circumstances gets completely written out. And uh, so I, 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 I think he's, you know, in terms of a last word, utterly committed to um, this reduction of, of, of matter to... Uh, something dead and passive, um, and it's it's despite himself because and it's because I mean I I really see these two vectors running through his talk his thought, um, one on the one hand towards this sort of systemizing teleology that reappears in all these different at all these different scenes, but then on the other hand this incredible. Uh, um, Sort of phenomenological sensibility. This, you know, this is sa save, saving the phenomena. Um, that he, you know, he's he's completely committed to that too. And it's and it's at those. Um, it's at, at what I'm interested in are these sort of moments where where the contradictions become absolutely uh, uh, um, visible and. Uh, you know, evident and, un, you know, so that's, that's, that's the project is to kind of bring those contradictory moments at the site of the female offspring, at the site of, you know, the doctoring, um, uh, um, at the site of these sort of bio biological problems that he's, uh, is, I mean, so interested in. Um, um, you know, it's you know the, the 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 production of the spleen or the liver. The spleen is automatos. There's no reason for it. But then there's this other organ that there, the liver. There is a reason for that. And there's there are just it's it's just these these very sort of strange moments where he's having I think to confront the limitations of his own project. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have time for I think one more question. And Emma, can I ask you to kind of keep this short? Yeah. So we've just seen the moments. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. So, so thank you so much because I think that uh, the, the 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 kind of work you do uh, displays so much of the uh, just. Uh, passionate carefulness that you are attributing to Aristotle. I thought uh, it was a tremendous presentation. Um, three things very quickly, I will just name them. Uh, uh, first of all, when you speak of the contradictions, uh, and this I think uh, is, is very uh, central to your work, uh, I mean, it's not as if Aristotle is not aware of them. He's the thinker of Apuria, after all. And you know, if you read Metaphysics Beta, it, it, it becomes very clear how the point is not overcoming aporias, but really laying them out and developing them. So just this thing. So when you're thinking contradiction in Aristotle, you're really thinking with Aristotle, I think, not despite Aristotle or against uh, Aristotle. So this is, in other words, something that the thinker is, uh, the thinker Aristotle is very aware of. It's not as if he just uh, uh, contradicts himself uh, and, and uh, it's an accident. Second thing, uh, um, Tecne uh, is a friend of uh, Tuke, he says. So Tecne does not have to do with technicity in the sense this term has come to work in recent times. I mean, Tecne is really a way in which you just do things with matter and you explore it and you go into it. And precisely, it's a way of encountering matter that goes far beyond whatever project you might want to project onto it. So much so that chance plays a major role. He says it in a few crucial places. So Techne is a friend of chance of precisely what the, the, the uh, technician or the artist does not control. Third thing, um, um, well, let me just, I want to be super brief because it's a little bit late, so I will simply mention the phrase, right? Uh, uh, the doctor healing itself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and this is nature. Mm -hmm. So here you have precisely under, an understanding of uh, of doctoring that does not quite fit with what you just said. 
where the matter becomes just inert and worked upon. Nature as doctor healing itself uh, requires a thinking of the healing and of the materiality of the embodiment together. So, uh, for me, it does fit, but I would like to know what you think. Thanks. Uh, I think these are really profound questions of interpretation. Um, that, that you raise, and I, I, I think that this is a, I'm not sure I have the time to really go in properly right now, and I hope that we can continue this conversation possibly over years. Um, uh, I, I think Aristotle is sometimes aware of his aporiae, and, and sometimes he's keen to cover them over. Um, techne, as uh, sometimes may, may be a, a friend of Tuche, I, I'm thinking, you know, the extraordinary uh, uh, chapters after, that, that follow uh, the account of the four essential causes that are on uh, Tuche and automaton and necessity in physics B. Um, you know, he's very clear about, you know, that, 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 that the technician can sometimes make a mistake, and this is he calls hamartia. Um, uh, you know, a grammarian can... can uh, can write, write, uh, can, can, what's the word, you know, miswrite, um, um, and so on. But I, I, I think that uh, in, in general, the, the images of the technician are images of mastery. I really, this, this is what, this is what I find when I read, but I would be willing to, to read with a different eye and, and see what, what, what comes. So I appreciate that as a provocation. Um, and uh, the doctor healing himself, you know, again, I, I, I can't help but hear that as the, as, 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 as the technical mastery of the doctor dominating everything. And I, I understand that you hear it very differently. But again, you know, I think this is a conversation that um, needs to unfold in a longer arc, but thank you very much.